All right, we, we, we surely know the title of this series now, Understanding Your Religion, Seven Major Doctrines That Define the Christian Faith, lesson number 21. We are doing the sub-doctrine of salvation. This is part two, and the name or the title of this particular session or lesson is The Role of Baptism and Communion. Talking about that. All right, so, so far, let me just uh, talk to you about the five major, I've talked about the sub-doctrines, just want to make sure we review the five major, five of the seven that we've done so far. So the first one is the inspiration of the Bible. I'm not going to read the scripture, but that is one scripture underneath there that, uh, that I'm showing you, one scripture of many that talk about this particular major doctrine. So the inspiration of the Bible, the Bible is completely inspired by God from Genesis to Revelation. It is God's will and content, and He used different men to record and preserve it in different ways. That's basically the summary of what we believe the Bible teaches concerning this major doctrine, the inspiration of the Bible. The second one, the divinity of Jesus Christ. John chapter one, verses one to 18. We believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And I should, again, not we believe, we believe the Bible teaches that God is fully, uh, that God, that Jesus is fully God, fully man, any lessening or changing of this is not what the Bible teaches concerning Jesus. All right. Major doctrine number three, the goodness of man. So we go back to Genesis chapter one, verse 31 to talk about that. And the Bible, uh, we believe the Bible teaches that man was created by God as good with the ability to exercise free will. We didn't evolve, we didn't develop. God created us fully formed. We also believe the Bible teaches that humans are made in God's image and not the result of random evolutionary process. We believe that's what the Bible teaches concerning man. A third major doctrine, the fall of man through sin. Again, Romans 3.23, there's a scripture that talks about that. Um, the decline of mankind and the creation itself resulting in death is caused by man's disobedience to God's laws. That's the primary reason. Okay. Now, we also believe the Bible teaches that even though man's nature is weakened by sin, he still retains his ability to make moral choices. So he is still accountable before God, despite the weakening of his nature. And then, fifth major doctrine that we've studied, the reconciliation of man with God. Uh, Romans 5.10, for example, we believe the Bible teaches that God's plan to save sinful man from eternal condemnation through Jesus Christ. We believe that's what the doctrine of reconciliation is. God taking the initiative to reconcile or to bring sinful man back into a proper relationship with himself. And this particular doctrine, the doctrine of reconciliation, is explained in detail through 10 sub-doctrines which are further divided into two sets of five. Okay? So we have uh, the first five sub-doctrines that explain reconciliation, the major doctrine of reconciliation. The first set of five actually describe God's plan for the reconciliation of mankind, or as we have referred to it, the plan of salvation. What is the plan of salvation? Well, the plan of salvation is described in these first five sub-doctrines that describe the doctrine of reconciliation. So there's the doctrine of election, 1 Peter 2.4. This teaching explains how God chooses or elects Jesus Christ to be the one through whom all men can be saved. That's what the doctrine of election teaches. Doctrine of predestination, Romans 8.29 and 30. This doctrine explains God's ability to know in advance that those who choose or believe in Jesus Christ will be saved. That's the, we believe that is what the doctrine of predestination teaches. Uh, number three, the doctrine of atonement, 1 Peter 2, 22 to 24. Uh, Sub-doctrine of atonement shows how Christ pays the moral debt of man's sin with his death on the cross. How, how does you know, how does God get rid of the sin? Well, He gets rid of the sin through the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's the how. 
how is reconciliation you know, uh, accomplished? It's accomplished through the atonement uh, of Jesus Christ. Fourth subdoctrine, redemption, Ephesians 1.7. This subdoctrine teaches about the freedom that a person experiences and obtains as a result of Christ's sacrifice. So the doctrine of atonement is the how. Okay, how is reconciliation accomplished through atonement? The doctrine of, redemp the doctrine of redemption is the result. What is the result of that? Well, the result is freedom. We're free from condemnation. There is no condemnation Therefore, for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1. And then the doctrine of regeneration, John 3, 3, 5. Regeneration is that doctrine that describes the life experienced by those who are free from sin and free from the fear of condemnation and death. I know this is a little harder than hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. I understand that's easier to memorize but I, I can't emphasize enough that, that those five things there, th that's not the plan of salvation. This is the plan of salvation. God chooses Jesus. He knows that His choice will succeed. Jesus dies on the cross to pay for sins. In doing that, men are freed from condemnation and they are regenerated. They, they have the new birth. That's God's plan. That's what He wanted. All right. The, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about baptism and communion in a moment. I'm just doing another little review. So then the other five sub-doctrines, these five explain the benefits of God's plan. All right? So the first uh, uh, of these, you know, the last five here, is the doctrine of adoption, Galatians 3.26. This teaching explains how God's plan creates a new relationship between himself and believers as sons and daughters. In other words, I said these five doctrines here, they're looking at reconciliation from five different perspectives. Okay? The next sub-doctrine, the doctrine of justification, looks at salvation from a legal perspective. So justification describes the new status that we have from a legal perspective a new status of innocence and acceptability because of God's plan. So all the language of justification is always talking about how we have been justified, how we have been made righteous, okay, from a legal perspective. The third one is the doctrine of perfection, Colossians 1.28. This doctrine explains the new quality of our spiritual lives as seen by God. In other words, when God looks at us, He sees us as fully mature, in Christ Jesus, not because of perfectionism, but because of our faith in Christ Jesus. All right? Still describing the plan of salvation, but looking at it from God's perspective. The doctrine of uh, sanctification, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Doctrine of sanctification explains what our new lifestyle is like. In other words, God's plan has given us a holy way to live. So when God says, uh, you'll be holy for I am holy, all right, that's, that's, that, that, that is a, an expression of the doctrine of sanctification, how God wants us to live. And then the doctrine of salvation, the sub-doctrine of salvation, the one we're studying, Mark 16, 16, this is the final teaching that describes the new distinction now made between ourselves and others because of God's plan. And this is the, this is the sub doctrine, by the way, that causes so much heartburn with other people. This is the sub doctrine where other people say, oh, you think you're the only ones going to heaven, or you think you're so good, and blah, blah, blah. And well, maybe the way we express it might kind of bring on that kind of uh, you know, response to people, but it's, it's, uh, the, it's fully natural. I mean, uh, the Bible teaches very clearly some are saved and some are lost. You know, Christianity is an exclusive religion and the doctrine of salvation is the doctrine that explains this idea. There's a difference between those who are saved and those who are lost. Okay. okay, so last week we said that the term salvation was shorthand for all the doctrines put together. To say God's salvation is to include all of the information about the inspired word, the divine son, the condition of mankind, God's plan of reconciliation, all of the stuff that we've been talking about for 20 weeks. 
you can take it all and just compress it all down into one word, salvation. It's the end result of everything that comes before it. I also showed you that baptism was always mentioned in the Bible in relationship to salvation. So we said that baptism is the historical moment when the benefits of salvation come into operation. I also told you that you know, the cross, that's the historical moment when the sins were paid for. There's a time, you, can, you could pinpoint it to a day, an hour, you know, when Jesus was crucified. That's historical, that's not metaphorical, that's not up in the air, that's a real thing that happened on a day at a certain time, and so, so historically, when were the sins paid for? Boom, on such and such a day at such and such an hour. Okay, when do we enter into the blessings of salvation? Well, on a certain day, a certain month, a certain hour. How do we know that? Well, it's the time of our baptism. Okay. Um, we come to this conclusion because every time, the, uh, the conclusion that baptism and salvation you know, is necessary, we come to this conclusion because every time baptism is mentioned in the New Testament, it is always mentioned as the point where salvation occurs. For example, in Galatians 3.27, Paul talks about being clothed with Christ for those who have been baptized. Well, do you know anybody who is lost who is clothed with Christ? No. Clothed with Christ is just an imagery that describes what? Salvation. And, 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 and Paul does what? He links that clothed with Christ uh, status with what? With baptism. All those of you who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So he links baptism with salvation using the imagery of being clothed with Christ. In Acts 22, Verse 16, when Saul is hearing the gospel from Ananias, what does Ananias say to him? Saul, Saul, why do you hesitate? Arise and be baptized and do what? And wash away your sins. So here's my question. Do you know anybody whose sins have been washed away who is lost? Is that how we refer to lost people? Of course not. People who have their sins washed away, those are the saved. Again, another image to describe the very same thing and yet, what is Luke doing? He's linking the imagery of salvation with the moment of baptism. He says you know, what Ananias said, what are you waiting for? Go and do what? Be baptized. And what happens? The historical moment when your sins are washed away. All right? You get another note here. So when we understand that baptism isn't a work in order to earn salvation, that's always the accusation. It is an expression of our faith, much like confessing Christ or repentance. Those are expressions of faith. I say to those who always say, oh, that's a work, you, know, you just have to confess Christ. Oh, wait a minute, I say, you just have to confess Christ? I say, explain to me exactly how you do that. Well, I, with my mouth, you know, I say, I believe that Jesus is the Son. Well, aren't you doing something? Aren't you moving your lips? Aren't you saying certain words? What's the difference between that and, and, and being you know, immersed in water. That's just another action. It's just a different kind of action. So I don't deny that confessing Christ is an expression of faith. I don't deny that making the decision to now have a different outlook on sin. Before sin, I didn't care. I did whatever I wanted. Now, now I try to avoid sin as my way of expressing my faith in Christ. And so we add to that baptism. Why? Is it because the Church of Christ added that? No, because you know, 10 times in the book of Acts alone, the, 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 you know, the, the writers uh, gave us examples of that. So the Bible teaches us that baptism is the place where God adopts us or makes us acceptable or sees us as perfect or sets us apart or rescues us. So with this knowledge, it helps us to answer some of the most asked questions about baptism. That's what we're going to do today. So the first most asked question is this, is baptism necessary? The answer is yes. Only saved people can claim to be obedient to the gospel, 
Only saved people can say, I'm a disciple of Jesus. Only saved people can say, my sins have been forgiven. Only people who are saved can say, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Only saved people can say, I'm a member of the body of Christ. I mean, duh, I could keep going here, but you get my point. Only saved people can claim to have or experience those things. So only saved people can claim to have these things, and these things are given, they come into effect at baptism. Like I said, last week I gave you 10 different scriptures to prove this. My question to somebody who asks me that question is, just how many more scriptures do I need to read to you to prove my point? Okay. Question number two. Doesn't the Bible say we're saved by faith? Well, yes. Yes, it does. But when it teaches this, it is always a response to those who are trying to be saved by a system of law or a system of culture. I want to make a, a statement here and I really want you to remember this, okay? Salvation has always been by faith, always. Not by perfect law keeping or belonging to a specific culture. I've heard people, even preachers say, well in the Old Testament they were saved by the law, but in the New Testament they're saved by faith. Wrong, wrong. Faith has always been what God has required of man in order to be in a right relationship with Him. From, from Adam and Eve all the way to the last person on, on earth. But faith has always been expressed according to God's will in concrete ways. For example, how did Noah express his faith? He built the boat. And how did Moses, how did he express his faith? Well, he returned to Egypt to face the Pharaoh. And believers in Jesus uh, on Pentecost Sunday, how did they express their faith? Well, they repented of their sins and they were immersed by the apostles. So here's another thing I want you to remember. In the New Testament, the writers always contrasted faith versus law, never faith versus baptism. See, the argument is a wrong argument. Okay? And if you step into that argument, you find yourself, why, why, am I, you know, why am I getting all tangled up here? It's because it's a false dichotomy. It's, it's false. It's not faith versus baptism. The writers always, always were contrasting uh, uh, salvation by a system of faith versus salvation by a system of law. And that's what Paul argues to the Galatians. You know, you've left so quickly, he says, the gospel that I taught you and gone back to doing what? Trying to save yourselves through, through law-keeping. Circumcision and you know, tithing and rules about worship. You know? So, the writers understood that baptism was simply an act of faith which demonstrated the authenticity of their belief. A person who believed the gospel expressed that faith in repentance and baptism and was thus saved. This is what obeying the gospel actually means. And we've talked about that. Isn't it interesting that nowhere in the New Testament, not one single instance in the New Testament does anyone question the necessity of baptism. There's no debate between any of the apostles or any of the disciples of the apostles about the necessity of baptism. No one in the Bible, from Matthew all the way to Revelation, not a single person, not a single word, is ever mentioned about the necessity of baptism. It was taken for granted. It's only in the modern time that we've kind of started this debate. The, it doesn't exist in the Bible. Now, the role of women in the church? Yes, that was a debate in the first century. They debated that. Paul had to write to the church in Corinth to kind of give instructions to Timothy uh, 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 how, when to put widows on the list for benevolence. That was an issue. They had to write about that. 
Circumcision, he had a right about that. Marriage and divorce, he had a right about that. So many problems. The epistles are really letters dealing with issues. But in not a single one of those epistles is there ever a defense of the necessity to be baptized in order to become a Christian. That's zero, zero discussion. So like I say, that's like, that's like a modern argument, made up argument that we talk about today, which is not even discussed. Okay, here's the doozy, number three. What about Romans chapter 10, 10 to 13? This passage is used by evangelicals to prove that the moment of salvation is, one, is when one gives intellectual assent. In other words, when they think or they decide to believe. This is the historical moment of salvation and not baptism. And the reason they believe this is because they do not interpret this passage in its proper context. So let's read the passage. Paul is saying, for with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him, for whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And usually when they read that to us, we go, uh, but, uh, well, uh, mm, we don't have an answer to that. Well, the answer to that is uh, taking a passage out of context to prove something that the passage was not meant to prove. I could do the very same thing as, because they say, look, it says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Boom, that's all you have to do. Well, you know what? I could do the same thing with, uh, let's see, Luke 24. Luke 24 says, and Jesus said to them, or He said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Oh boy! Well, we've just eliminated baptism here, we've eliminated confessing Christ. All you have to do is repent. If I just take that one scripture alone, I can make a case that so long as you feel bad about your sins, you'll be forgiven, because isn't that what it says? It's exactly what it says. So it's easy to take one passage and build your whole case on one passage, but when you're formulating doctrine and practice, you have to take all the passages that talk about that thing and build, your, and build your case. So let's take a look at Romans 10, 10 to 13 in context. And in order to do that, I have to tell you what the whole book of Romans is about, we'll, but we're going to do that in a very, uh, very quick way, okay? So if you're to study a survey of Romans, it works like this. Chapters one to three, Paul proves the point that all men are guilty of sin, both Jews and Greeks. That's chapters one to three. Chapters four and five, Paul puts forth God's plan of salvation through reconciliation achieved with Christ. So in chapters four and five, he explains the plan of salvation. Okay. In Romans six, seven, and eight, he explains the response to God's offer of salvation and the terms of the new life in Christ. Six, seven, and eight. All those who are buried with Christ in baptism uh, you know, will resurrect with Christ. And then in chapter seven and eight, he talks about the new life in the spirit and, that, and so on and so forth. In chapters nine, 10, and 11, he answers the question, how come the Jews who had all of these advantages missed the boat? They lost. They didn't believe in the Messiah. What happened? How come they didn't get saved? Yet they had everything. So Paul explains why that is in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And then in chapters 12 to 16, he explains how we should live as Christians. Okay? You know, offering ourselves as living sacrifices. Okay? And he goes on for four chapters to describe the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. Okay. So the passage that we talked about, Romans 10, 10 to 13, is right in the middle of the section where Paul is explaining why the Jews who had great spiritual advantages failed to receive the promised salvation. That's what he's explaining there and that's what that passage is, you know, is located. So Paul is comparing the Gentiles who did not know God but accepted Jesus, he's comparing them to the Jews who had the law and the prophets and the promises but rejected Jesus. And he says that the Jews rejected Jesus because among other things, they tried to achieve righteousness 
through law keeping and ritualism and they thought they were succeeding. All right? Then he goes on to say that the Gentiles, on the other hand, they pursued salvation through a system of faith in the Savior, in His cross, and their proper response to Him. Okay, now watch. At this point, Paul quotes from the Old Testament to demonstrate that this idea of salvation through a system of faith was known in Old Testament times and was not a new doctrine as the Jews may have accused him of teaching. What's this new doctrine you're doing? What's this new business you're bringing about here? Salvation by faith and blah, blah, blah. And Paul is answering back, salvation by faith has always been the way that God has, has saved us. And what does he do? If he says this is not a new theology, it was taught by the prophets themselves. And what does he do? He quotes Isaiah 28, 16 and Joel 2.32, that passage, you know, if you confess with your mouth and so on and so forth, you'll be saved. So that passage there is not explaining how we respond to the offer of the gospel. That passage is explaining that faith has always been the way that human beings have responded to God. And he supports that idea by quoting two different prophets who say that, who, who, who proclaim that you know, if you call on God, if you, if you believe in Him, you'll be saved. You see, the, you see the, the difference there? So he's explaining the method that God uses to save us, a system of faith, not the response to the gospel, which is faith expressed in repentance and baptism, Romans chapter six. Remember I said to you a little bit before, in the Bible, the, the, the contrast, the argument was always faith versus, not faith versus baptism. This is the perfect example of that. In Romans 10, he's saying law was never the way we were saved. Law keeping was never the way we were saved. Faith was always the way we were saved. Another Bible thing that you have to know if you're studying the Bible, the, the, the writers of the Bible didn't write everything about a certain subject every time they mentioned that subject. Because if that was the case, I mean, the Bible would be that thick. <laughs> Imagine if every time we had this lesson, I retaught lessons one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, we're in lesson 21, I begin by teaching lessons one to 20, well, we'd be here for days. I'm assuming that you already know the basics that we've talked about, and I move on. Well, that's exactly what the writers of the New Testament do. They, they believe that their readers understand you know, the idea of the response of faith, and he's taken three chapters to explain it, Romans 4, 5, and 6. So he doesn't repeat all of that again in Romans chapter 10. Okay, is that, is that good? Is that, you see, okay. I, I understand maybe if you had to repeat that, that might be a, a bit of a task, but understand every time that thing comes out, you, and you happen to be talking to somebody, your response is, he's comparing faith and law here. He's not comparing, he's not answering the question, how do I respond to God? What is the response of faith? You just flip back to Romans 6 and show them, here's the response of faith, okay? All right, uh, number four, uh, four questions. Uh, should I be rebaptized? Right. A lot of people ask this question because they're not sure how to resolve the issue. So in Acts chapter 19, we have a good information, we have good information to help us decide this, this problem. I think most of you are familiar, in Acts chapter 19, Paul rebaptizes 12 men who had been baptized in the proper way by immersion, but for the wrong reason. They had been baptized in John the Baptist's baptism, and the meaning of that baptism was to prepare for the coming of the Messiah but they were baptized in John's baptism, I mean, after Jesus had come, had died on the cross, had resurrected, appeared to the apostles and gone back to heaven, and then after all of that happened, these people were baptized in John the Baptist's baptism. See what I'm saying? So Jesus' command to baptize in His name or in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth, eclipsed John's baptism. So what does Paul do? 
So Paul rebaptizes these 12 men and uh, he explains salvation to them in terms of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. And then he rebaptizes them so they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the first question? Uh, uh, did you receive the Spirit, he says to them. In other words, he's questioning, you know, what, what, talk to me about your conversion. Did you receive the Spirit? And they said, well, we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. Well, obviously, you know, they were not taught the, the very basics. So Paul, understand here, Paul could have explained salvation using any other image. He could have talked about salvation in terms of sonship or having a clear conscience or being clothed with Christ, but he didn't. He chose only one image of salvation to explain you know, uh, salvation to them and, and then he baptized them. So here's the question to ask when it comes to re-baptism. Number one, was I baptized in the right way? Now the right way, the manner, is by immersion in water as a repentant believer in Christ. Uh, there is no one today with the scholarship that we have, not just in the churches of Christ, but I mean in any scholarship, there's no one today that doesn't understand and know that the method of baptism during the time of John the Baptist and Jesus was by immersion. No, no, reputable, no reputable scholar today would argue that baptism was by sprinkling, no. I mean, the language used, there's several different words used. There's a separate Greek word used to, for the term to sprinkle. There's another complete different uh, Greek term to use for pouring. And then there's a third Greek term uh, used to, um, to really? Uh, there's a third Greek term uh, used to describe immersion. And every time in the New Testament they talk about baptism, they always use the Greek word for immersion or to plunge. So today you know, it's beyond you know, argument that baptism is uh, by immersion. And I tell people, well, you know, maybe you were a baby and you didn't remember, or maybe you, somebody just threw some water at you. So you have to be A, number one, be baptized in the correct way. And then number two, was I baptized for the right reason? The reason for baptism is salvation. That's the reason. And that salvation could have been explained to you in a variety of ways. Uh, you could have been baptized to obey the gospel. Well, that's when you obey the gospel, that's salvation. Or you could have been baptized to become a disciple of Jesus. Well, that's salvation. Or you could have been baptized because you were looking for the new birth or somebody explained to you salvation in terms of being born again. Well, that's salvation. Or you could have been baptized to receive the forgiveness of sin, the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. That's, you know, that's salvation. So when you are baptized for one of these ideas connected to salvation, you receive all of the blessings. For example, I'll use myself. So I was baptized in 1977 and I did it and I remember doing it because I, I really stumbled or focused on Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved and I saw that as a question of obeying Jesus. I had never done that. I had never myself said, you are the Son of God and in order to be saved, I need, to, I need to repent of my son, you know, I need to believe in you and I need to be baptized. I had been baptized before Man, I was the most dunk person you could ever meet. I mean, I, you know, I, was, I was baptized as a baby in the Catholic Church and then I, I went with the Pentecostals for a while and I was baptized in the Spirit with them and somebody else baptized me in a lake, all for a variety of reasons, none of which were, were in the Bible. So when I saw that, uh, I was baptized, clearly understanding what I was doing. Now here's the thing. At that time, I didn't understand that when I was baptized, God would have His Spirit dwell in me. I didn't grasp that idea. I didn't grasp the idea that I was becoming a son of God. I didn't grasp the idea that God would see me as mature, as perfect in Christ. You know, those ideas had not yet been taught to me. And I learned them as I went along. It was a wonderful road of discovery. Whoa, the Holy Spirit actually dwells in me. Romans 8, the Spirit that's in me is the same Spirit that was in Christ and the Spirit that raised Christ, that same Spirit's going to raise me up. Wow, that's awesome. 
What I didn't do, thankfully I had a, I had a good teacher, is I didn't run back to the water and, and get rebaptized every time I discovered something new about baptism. The idea is there can be 10 different biblical reasons to become a son of God, to obey, to become a disciple, to be added to the church, to receive the Holy Spirit. And, you know, there are 10 different biblical imagery, if you wish, that explains what happens when you're baptized. If you're baptized for one of those, you, you get all of them. Conversely, if you're baptized for not a biblical reason, then you don't get any of them. All right? So if you were baptized to show that you were saved uh, 10 years ago, no. If you were baptized uh, to please your mother, no. If you were baptized because it's your birthday, no. You know, though, th th that doesn't work. All right? um, if you were baptized so you could take communion, so these are not biblical ideas and, and you should perhaps reconsider, I'm saying, reconsider, restudy the issue. So the, the, you know, the little equation, a biblical reason, a biblical method equals salvation. All right, one other thing, let's talk about communion. I've only got about five minutes, so pray that you just stay with me here. Um, there's a beautiful fulfillment and dynamic at work when we take the Lord's Supper because in this action is stitched together all of the doctrines, believe it or not, that we've studied. So in Acts 2.42, one of the first actions we see recently baptized converts doing is sharing the Lord's Supper. Whereas baptism marks the historical moment when we appropriate all the blessings provided for us through God's plan of salvation, communion is a commemoration of God's plan throughout history. See the difference? So the symbols remind us of the plan. The choice of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice broken for us, the death as a payment to bring freedom and life, the common action of eating and drinking reminds us of our benefits. You ever wonder what should I be thinking about you know, when I'm taking communion? Well you should be thinking about all the blessings you have in Christ. Think about that, meditate on those things, the very things we've been talking about here, because that's part of what communion is for. To think about, you know, it's because we're told sometimes, think about the nails going into his hands and think about the spear going into his side. Yes, of course, think about that. But it, communion is not just about that. It's about the new life that we have, the communion that we have with the church. Um, Think about the fact that we are now innocent, acceptable children, holy before God, eating and drinking with each other. This is why communion is taken after baptism and not before baptism. And then the repetition, you know, each Lord's Day, as a reminder to the world that God's plan will one day be completed when the Lord comes again. There won't be any communion in heaven. Not taking communion in heaven because in heaven, we're going to have the real thing. Here we just remember what will permit the real thing, but in heaven we have the true communion with the Lord Himself and all of His glorified saints. So through baptism and communion, God's plan of salvation and man's faith come together in a concrete physical form that blesses man and that honors God. All right, so next time, we're going to start talking about the last two major doctrines that will end our series, and that's the doctrine of the kingdom and then the doctrine of the end times, the end of the world. Those are the two last major doctrines. All right, thank you for your attention.